Welcome to the WordPress Photography Podcast, the podcast for photographers who want to learn how to get the most out of WordPress to grow their photography business. You don't need to be a geek to understand WordPress. Settle back and listen as we show you how. Now, here's your host, Scott wyden Kibowitz. Welcome to episode 43. My name is Scott wyden Kibowitz, and I'm joined by today's guest, Mark Silber. Mark, I've been interacting with you for many years, um, different channels, that. yeah, about different things. Um, we had some WordPress interaction at one point, um, and I've been uh, following your YouTube videos and, and basically um, a lot of, basically what you've been doing just everywhere for years. Um, so I'm really excited to have you on. Let me tell everybody who you are. Um, okay. You are an author, a photographer, a filmmaker, a producer of the very popular series on YouTube called Advance Your Photography, where you have interviewed scores of some of the biggest names in photography. Yep. Um, you started out learning darkroom skills and the basic of photography at the legendary Peninsula School uh, in Menlo Park, California. You're still in California, right? I am. I'm in cool. Carmel, California, a couple hours away. Nice. Um, you moved on to hone your skills to professional uh, standards at the famed San Francisco Art Institute. Uh, you moved into teaching photography in workshops all over the country and became re uh, renowned as an engaging and helpful speaker and coach. And that's some of your greatest joys. <laughs> I hope I can live so, up to all that. <laughs> and other joys include backpack, backpacking, surfing or snowboarding. That's right. And and uh, taking walks with your wife and your golden retriever. <laughs> you know a lot about me. I must have given you that information. I gave <laughs> yeah, you some clues there. Yeah. And, and what's your dog's name? Shyla. Shyla. Nice. Shyla you, is you very know. photogenic, and she appears in, the, in my book, Advancing Your Photography. She's a good model. She loves to have her pictures nice. taken. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, that's one area of photography that I kind of just never want to get into is pet photography. Um, you know, it's, it's tricky. Like, it's very tricky. You've, you've really got to have a, 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 some really good expertise with, with animals to, to do that. So I, I totally uh, envy the people who can do that because the, you can do some beautiful work with, with animals. Yes, you can. Um, so before we dive into what's going on with you, because I know there's a lot going on with you, uh, I want to dive into some WordPress photography related news. Sure. Um, the first one is Photo Plus Expo is coming up at the end of October. I think it's the 25th or the 28th. It's in yeah. New York City. I will be there uh, hanging out, uh, talking WordPress with people. I won't have a booth, but look for me. I'll be wearing an Imagely t-shirt. Um, so, so look for me. And uh, I, if, if, I, if you see that I have the my camera with me let's hop on and record some maybe we can record a, a podcast episode so say hi if you see me at um photo plus expo uh next is project gutenberg i think i mentioned this a few times in the podcast before the hiatus project gutenberg is the content block editor coming to wordpress it's basically if you've ever used medium.com it's going to be very similar to that there's a love-hate relationship that people have with the beta version of this editor, but it's coming to WordPress 5.0, whether we like it or not. So probably in 2018, we're going to see this new editor, which will confuse you if you've never seen it before, but you might find it easier to use. You might find it more difficult to use. Hopefully you find it useful and just Google or go to the show notes and you all link to uh, Project Gutenberg, an article about it, so you can check it out. Uh, next is NextGen Gallery is going through a redesign of the backend interface. We are completely redesigning the, the user interface. And it is there's a beta of NextGen Gallery and NextGen Pro available to everybody. Uh, NextGen Gallery is available to anybody for free worldwide. NextGen Pro is available to any Photocrati Pro customers or Imagely or, or you know, NextGen Pro customers uh, can test the beta of that as well. Um, and we're looking for feedback on that. So please test it and send in your feedback. And then the last bit is we are adding a new thing to the show. At the end of every episode, there will be a question for you. Um, so Mark has a question prepared. So when you get to the end of the show, you'll be able to see what the question is. And, and then you'll, I'll tell you how to answer it. So <laughs> awesome. So that's the news. Um, so, Mark, what's going on with you? 
You know, I am now creating um, uh, courses that go along with my book. I've, uh, I've authored maybe five to eight of them that will be video, short little videos that take you through sections of the book. But more than just shooting a video, they're also going to be interactive. So you have to get out and do whatever it is I'm talking about. Nice. Because at the end of the day, the only way you're really going to learn and retain something is by putting it into use. Right. So I've, I basically sifted through those things in my book that will apply to any kind of camera, especially a smartphone, which many people are using exclusively these days. Because you have to, when it comes down to it, you have to be able to use these set of skills, and some of them we're going to talk about today, to produce great content. Nice. Yeah, that, that's exciting because um, the, the book goes into a lot of instruction. A lot of people like myself are more hands-on and visual learners. So having a, a course that has video content as well as you know, actual hands-on instruction, go out and do this. Yes. It's definitely going to be a better way to learn, for me at least, people like me, than just reading the book. Exactly. Uh, so. You have to have them both. And, I, you know, you can watch it on your smartphone. You could then go out and use your smartphone to do whatever that exercise is. Nice. Keeps it really and simple. You, um, as a side question, will you be at Photo Plus Expo? I'm hoping to. I actually have a proposal in with a very big, I won't say the name, but one of the big uh, photography blogs to actually go out and produce a number of interviews for them. Nice. So, so I'll follow up with that. And I hope to be there and definitely will be on the floor going around talking to people. Great. So uh, I will hopefully I will see you there and we can uh, catch up, maybe grab a, some coffee or tea or something. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Um, so let's dive into today's topic, which is finding content ideas through inspiration. Yes. Um, I, I've talked a lot about ways to find, uh, ways to come up with content, ways to be inspired to create content. As a content creator, even with uh, all the advice that I've given and all the techniques and, uh, and tricks that I've come up with myself and routines and things, you still get burnt out on coming up with ideas. Yeah. And this is whether you're blogging, whether you're trying to find something new to photograph, whether you're creating a YouTube video, whatever it is, it's so easy to get burnt out on ideas. You have to feed that monster, don't you? <laughs> oh. And that monster is, is going to drain you because it is, you know, yeah, what is my next video going to be? What is my next blog post going to be? And you feel sometimes like you're up against the wall. Yeah, you know, so, so uh, to give you an idea, so I was at one point getting a little like tight on my content idea list and I didn't know where to go next. So uh, for my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Scott Wyden, I, 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 I partnered with Mac Worldwide Warranty, uh, the, one of the largest warranty companies for cameras and electronics. Nice. And uh, I went to their headquarters and basically went to their staff and said, I need a list of five questions that your customers ask on a regular basis. What are the five most popular questions? And I went in, they have an education space there, which is doubles as a conference room. And I went in there and recorded what was intended to be five questions, turned out to be eight questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I, but I left having, you know, eight questions of videos, basically. Yeah. So I now had almost two months of YouTube videos to, to be able to, schedule out which was fantastic that's awesome um so it's that kind of stuff like you know for me it it came down to i was in a tight spot all i had to do was ask a question to somebody else to give me the ideas to create new content that is a great way to go about it it really is because you one of the key things is just getting out of your own head you know yeah you have to look out and see what are people interested in and what what can I provide for them? That's that's really good advice. Yeah. So so tell me uh, from uh, from your perspective, and I know you, in in your book you you go over this, um, and and you've you've done a recent video on content on on inspiration. Yeah. Um, so so let's talk about that. Tell me tell me what your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean this is the key to the whole thing because you know without some sort of inspiration, it it doesn't pan out whether it's producing a video or a blog post or a photograph. And so in my book, I break it down into really two stages. 
it comes under the heading of what we call visualization. Visualization means to see in your own mind before you press the shutter or before you write a blog post. I mean, it's equally true for any really any creative activity. Because without that, it's sort of like trying to go into your kitchen and say, I want to make a great meal. I'm just going to pull things out of the refrigerator and throw them into a hot pan and hope that it all comes together. Now, maybe a great chef can pull that off, but mortals like you and I probably are going to end up with a mess. And it just doesn't work. So it's, it's far better to step back for a minute and go, what do I want to make? You know, what am I hungry for? Well, I want Mexican food. Okay, let's make fajitas. You kind of visualize it and then you follow, you know, your own recipe or a recipe out of a book. So the first step in content creation is to get that vision. Now that leads to the next question. So what happens if I don't have anything? I mean, I'm, dr I'm, I'm drilling a, a hole in the ground. I'm coming up with a dry <laughs> hole and I can't think of anything that I want to... I just am lacking inspiration and visualization. Okay, here's the well that you can go to. And that, you know, Scott, it's interesting because I've done over a thousand hours of interviews with some really great photographers, Joe McNally, Bambi Cantrell, Chase Jarvis, Annie Leibovitz, you know, <laughs> the, the offspring of, of two of the biggest photographers in our last century, I recently did a series with Edward Weston's grandson, and I've done a whole series with Ansel Adams' son. Uh, those, I think, what some of my first videos I watched of yours were those. Was the was the Ansel Adams' son video? Yeah, and you know they th those guys were up against that same problem. You know, it wasn't like they magically had inspiration every morning. They had to come right. up with their own ideas. So my best recommendation is this. Look at others' work. And, and I, I actually build out a whole section in my chapter about this. Uh, George Lois, who isn't a photographer, but he's an incredible designer. He produced something like 97 covers of Esquire magazine. I mean, really iconic covers. George Lois wrote a book called Damn Good Advice. It's a really great little book for any creative to get you inspired. And his recommendation, which is my recommendation, is go to museums a lot. Go look at the original art. You know, one of the things we have to do is get off of our computers. Computers take art and they kind of flatten it. You know, you're not, you're not going to see the real depth of that image, whether it's a painting or a photograph or sculpture or whatever, unless you see it live. So one thing a creative can do, and he goes every week, Every week he goes to the, uh, the Met in New York and just his, his image on that is you have to keep feeding your own creativity. Yeah. And if you don't feed it, you're not going to come up with your own inspiration. You know, uh, it's interesting that you said go to an art gallery or a museum. Is, yeah. So um, I was, well, when was this? This was, yeah, it was a few months ago. We, I was in Chicago for the Out of Chicago Photography Conference, and one of the workshops that, uh, that I helped lead was actually to an area of Chicago known for their unique graffiti. Huh. And, and I never thought, I'm not a big on graffiti, but I never thought I'd be inspired by graffiti. And then we happened upon the side of one of the train tracks and you know chicago trains are usually elevated they're yeah, above the ground yeah so you know there's tons of of layers of of cement that you know are basically making walls and there's tunnels that you know foot tunnels and car tunnels going under them and um, on one of these walls of cement with the train above it was this giant rat and oh that's you know, a <laughs> that's a that's a characteristic uh trademark yeah. So, so at first I'm thinking, is this Banksy, right? Because Banksy used rats. It wasn't and it Banksy. Wasn't, it wasn't Banksy. It was somebody else. But what I found was really interesting was you're walking and you're like, okay, it's a big rat, 
It's a big rat. It's not in Banksy style. Okay. Maybe it's a Banksy. When you, when you finally get to it, it says who it was, but I can't, off the top of my head, I can't remember it. But um, you, you get closer to like the middle of the rat, and all of a sudden, there's a separation in the cement. So um, let's say what my, this hand's in front. So you're starting here. Once you get to the where my uh, fingertip is, if you're not watching this video, sorry if, you're, if you only there. listen to the audio, you won't be able to see this. But uh, basically, in between my two hands, which one is in front of the other, is another wall connecting the two. Huh. And in there is the guts of the rat. So you can kind of look inside it? So you can't see it until you get to that point. Oh, that's pretty clever. Right? So that, that got me thinking, like, how can I incorporate this into my photography? Such a simple thing of seeing some new art out on the street. Absolutely. Gets your brain going. Well, that's the thing. You know, the great artists, there's a, uh, a really fantastic uh, photo documentary of Pablo Picasso um, by David Douglas Duncan, who was a World War II photographer. And he spent, uh, it looked like many different uh, time periods with Picasso and just followed, around, followed him around and took pictures of him. And one of the scenes was him being inspired. He's eating some kind of white fish, and he pulls out the, the skeleton, the spine, and he holds it up. And then the next sequence, you see him in his studio making fillets out of clay <laughs> and pressing in the spine. And he basically made a plate that resembled what he just ate. But it was art. Yeah. He was being inspired by life. Another sequence is he goes to the bullfights. And he's very animated and engaged in the bullfight. Then he comes home and he does a, a, a whole series of lithographs of the bullfight. So you could see how he was just constantly taking life in and turning that into his own inspiration. And, you know, whether he actually said what Steve Jobs attributed to him, which was uh, good artists create great artists steal. I think that's how the quote, it's sort, of a, it's sort of a questionable whether Picasso actually said that or not, but Steve Jobs used to quote him. <laughs> but whether we call it stealing or really just borrowing, that's how all great art comes about. You know, right. somebody comes up with, I mean, you know, a new movement like hip hop. You can trace that back to Bob Dylan, uh, his uh, subterranean homesick blues, where he basically read a poem, and right. and hip hoppers, rappers came along later and sort of turned that into a whole genre. But it whatever whatever we do, it's really important to not just go I like that or I don't like that. It's one of the kind of the curses of our social media. It's like, oh, you know, great thumbs up or a like or whatever. You have to dig deeper. So if you're inspired by a piece of art, look at it closely. And I actually, in the book, um, I give you a little checklist. So when you're looking at it, you should observe these things. And by the way, you mentioned in your uh, video that, you know, it's good to write these things down. I like to actually keep a paper notebook, mm -hmm. you know, get off the computer and just analog and put a paper notebook there. So yeah. while you're looking at something, you're going through a museum and you come across something that really inspires you, whether it's a museum or out on the street, like you just described, I give a whole little sequence of questions that you should ask yourself, write these things down in your notebook. So how was this? How is the subject composed within the frame? I mean, the most basic thing about a, phot a photograph is framing it, which basically means how you put whatever it is that you're looking at out there inside your rectangle. How did you frame it? Uh, how was it lit? Where was the light coming from? How did it strike the subject? What was your impression emotionally when you saw it? So if you go through these, this little checklist here that I give in here, you can actually break it down and try to see what are those ingredients that I could utilize in my own work and 
take that back with you for your next project or a whole list of them. Yeah, you know, and you're the, the, that step with uh, analyzing the light, that's a skill in itself. So it is, you know, you're going to train yourself to be a better photographer, to work with, with light in a much better way by analyzing the light in both other photographs and in painting and in painting Vermeer is a classic example and I give that here right now I am lit per Vermeer I have a I have a north facing window here that's letting in light and that's the only light in the room so you know this side of my face obviously is better lit than this side and that's all he did is he had one window and his subject he just was a master at, at composing the subject within that frame using that one light source. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. Stop and look at how that particular photograph or painting was lit. And then you'll have that in your own little visual library. Next time you go out, you can utilize that. Yeah. I, I always, I always uh, used to expose so that everything was on the brighter side. Um, and... As I started getting into street photography more and more, which I, I don't do that professionally, I just do it for fun yeah. uh, whenever traveling mostly, but I, I, I was admiring people who would always do street photographs that were on the darker side, where it was mostly in the shadows, and then you see very little that was actually properly exposed. Yeah. And, and then I just kept admiring it, admiring it, and, and liking it digitally, and saving it, and, you know, and, and then eventually I'm like, you know what? Screw this. Next time I'm out doing whatever on the streets in New York and Chicago, Philly, wherever I am, I am going to start exposing dark. Right. And, and it, when you start actually thinking, uh, how can I uh, learn from all these images that I've been admiring for so long and actually put into effect, your whole view on that genre of photography just doesn't necessarily change but there's a shift and you just like your 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 skill level goes from here to here like goes from like totally. you know, up a whole notch because you're just you're putting all this into effect and you're learning from your mistakes as you're trying these new yeah. things and you know something as simple as just you know underexposing there it's not just a matter of just underexposing it's okay now i need to find the light that'll work well with underexposing exactly so, yeah, that's, so, yeah, that's really good advice. And just testing those things out and trying it out. And, you know, we all yeah. go through that when we're learning some new skill or, or testing out a new genre or whatever. You yeah. have and to put I, it into use. And I think we should, we should definitely um, emphasize the importance of getting out and seeing things non-digitally, which you already mentioned. But yes. I, um, so my friend Brian Matias um, and uh, Sharky James, who's from Petapixel, Start a new podcast called uh, the No No Name Photo Show, and because they couldn't think of a name, so they just huh. called it No Name Photo Show. Um, I will link to that in the show notes. And their second episode, I believe, they talked about how they used to go to 500 PX and Flickr for inspiration, and and that sort of getting that started getting like sort of like a flat line of yeah. uh, in inspirational quality. So they started looking at Instagram only, just looking at the feed of Instagram. And even there, now they're starting to flatline, getting yeah. uh, uninspiring images. That Not bad images, just nothing to inspire them to do more. So I think a takeaway that I wish that they said, which I don't think they did, was actually get out and see Absolutely. real images printed or paintings printed. So I, I think that's, it's so important to emphasize uh, how effective that could actually be. You know, Scott, that's one of the things that I think is, has uh, been the downside of our digital age is we, we've kind of forgotten that the roots of photography are a print, you know? And when you put a print on the wall and it's something obviously you're proud of, you can draw your own inspiration from your own work because also you have something there that you can show to other people and you can see what resonates with them. What do they see when they look at it? And yep. what is it about it that really intrigues them? That gives you, that kind of goes back to that point you mentioned about asking questions. You know, let your viewer see it. You can stand right next to them and hear what they're saying. 
But I think it's one of the most important things that a photographer should strive for is creating your own gallery, you know, create your own image and put them on the wall, frame them beautifully. Take your one, one piece of advice from Chase Jarvis about creating your own portfolio is take your 10 best images and make that your portfolio. And yep. as you progress, that 10 images can shift, but only like eliminate one and put a new one in. Don't make it yep. 12, 14, yep. 80, you know, whatever. Yep. That's really going to show your range as an artist as well. But it's a great challenge for you to compile those 10 best images and you're showing those to other people to kind of represent your work. Now, for the photographers that do multiple genres of photography, so let's say a wedding photographer who also does engagements, sure. would you recommend doing 10 total or 10 wedding and then 10 engagement? I would probably say you could split it up. You know, if, if, it's, if it's like portraiture, engagement, wedding, let's say those fit together yep. pretty well. You could yep. do 10 of each or you could break it into like maybe four or five of each. I think the important thing is you don't have so many that you overwhelm your right. viewer. You yeah. know? And if they want to see more, they can go to the blog and see some recent weddings you've done or recent you know, engagements you've done, stuff like that. And, uh, and, and blog tra blogs are really where, where people want to see recent work anyway. So it's a, good, it's a good way to give people a taste with the portfolio and send them to recent work exactly. elsewhere. So, exactly. And less um, is more in this case. You, know, you don't have to blast your whole you know, portfolio of all the different countries you visited. And I, I've seen that, you know, and it's to me, I, I, I start to lose interest pretty fast. If I see like 80 photographs or, you know, different compartments, I'd rather just see those, those best images. And then if I want to dig deeper, I can. Nice. So, so um, how do you take this, uh, what everything that you teach about inspiration for, photo, for photography, and, and how do you use it for creating new blog content or creating a new YouTube video? Um, how do you incorporate it into that? Like, where do you, how do you, how do you incorporate it into coming up with ideas for something that's more uh, on the educational side of, of what you do? Yeah. Okay. Great question. Well, here's a good recent example is my uh, visit to Edward Weston's house. So Edward Weston, a lot of people don't know who he is. You know, he was a contemporary with Ansel Adams. He never achieved the household recognition, household name status that Ansel Adams had. But he was a phenomenal artist. Very, very different than Ansel. He basically photographed two, two areas of uh, subject. One was nudes, beautiful nudes. And the other is everyday objects that he showed you the beauty of these objects. And you can, you can Google pepper number 30, which is his most famous photograph. It's a photograph of a green bell pepper, you know, the kind that you cut up and put in your salad. And he actually ended up doing 38 different exposures until he got the right one. So I've always admired his work, and I'm in a fortunate position where I, if I admire a photographer's work, often I can go meet with them and find out more about them. And in this case, he, you know, he passed on in 1956 or so. So I ended up meeting with his grandson, who's also a photographer, going to his house, uh, shooting an episode in the house itself, and then shooting another episode in the darkroom. So your question is, so how did, I, how did I come up with that concept? Well, that's just my, my own desire to know more about this artist. So I figure if I'm intrigued by this guy and I have questions and I go ask those questions, I try to, I try to ask the questions that not only I think of, but also I think my audience might have. Like simple questions like pepper number 30, how did he expose that? Well, it turns out, this is really interesting, and you'll see it in the video. He used an 8x10 camera. Okay, that's what we call large format. And in order to get the depth of field that he wanted, he had to create his own stop. 
And a stop is basically a piece of metal inserted into the lens with a hole in it. That's why we call them f-stops, by the way. I, def mm -hmm. I define that in the book because most people don't really know, why do you call it f-stop? Why not f-circle or f-opening or, <laughs> you know, why, why the word stop? Yeah. Well, a stop is a, is a piece of metal that's inserted into something. And in this case, they used to use different size openings for different f-stops. Anyway, the f-stop that he created was f-240, basically a pinhole. Yeah, that's intense. And in order to get the exposure, he exposed it for four to six hours. Now, there's a guy who is dedicated to his craft. And I think it's an interesting exercise. Sometimes, you know, we can go kind of scatter our attention all over the place and take photographs of many, many different things. Great. That's obvious when you're traveling or you're doing a wedding or whatever, obviously you're going to take many, many different photographs. But what if as an exercise, you just took one thing, one person or one object and photographed them many, many different ways until you found the one that really just, bam, that's it. <laughs> and that's what he did. And that I find really inspiring because that's something I've never done. You know, I've never taken a, a tree or... or a piece of sculpture or whatever and just photographed it every day for maybe two months until I found the one that really resonated for me. Uh, I've done that with some objects like in Yosemite, Half Dome, for instance. You know, I've taken a lot of different photographs of Half Dome, different times of uh, different locations at sunset and sunrise. And, you know, and then I came up with one that I thought really kind of captured everything I was looking for. But I hope that answers your question. For my video production, I basically get an idea of the story I want to tell, and then I go out and record it. For me, often that story doesn't really come together until I'm editing it. Because while I am capturing it, I'm mainly just trying to get enough information so that when I go to edit it, the story is going to be there. Yeah, and then you're just, you're just sort of fine-tuning taking all those clips and fine-tuning it to make it into, a, into the one coherent story. Exactly. And most of it consists of throwing stuff away. You oh, know, that's, yeah. a, that's an interesting thing about editing your own work. You, have to, you, get in, you fall in love with something, and you have to be able to throw it away, whether it's writing. <laughs> We've all done that. You know, you, yep. you, you write a long post, and you, and you look at it, and you go, you know, this section here really doesn't need to be there. It's, it's something I want to say, but I don't really think it's helping the viewer or my reader understand this. So I'm going to, you know, you have to be willing to throw those things away. Yeah, yeah. And, and having an editor to, to look at that, whether it's video, photo, or text, um, is very useful to help you it determine really what, what needs to be thrown away. You know, oh. Scott, uh, one, of my, one of my greatest videos that I never made was... Uh, uh, meeting up with Annie Leibovitz and touring an exhibit that she had in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, the, the video that I shot was with maybe 80 to 100 other press were there. She and I went to the same art school, the San Francisco Art Institute that you mentioned at the beginning. And at the end of the show, everybody disappeared, including my video team, her handlers, and it was just her and I walking through her exhibit together. And I have that video in my head, but I had no <laughs> camera. But one of the things we discussed, and I thought this was really, really good advice, she said, you have to have somebody edit your work for you. Meaning her, her photographic work. Yeah. Because if you don't have that other person, you're going to either miss photographs that should be included, or maybe include something that doesn't need to be there. So you're absolutely right. You should, when in writing, video production or whatever, have somebody else that can help you edit it. And that will yeah. that'll help your inspiration as well. Yeah, and that's it's pretty easy to come by to, uh, uh, photo editors, video editors, and you know text content editors. It's so easy to come by. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Somebody um, you trust, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, have you ever thought about meeting up with Andy Leibovitz again and sort of recreating that conversation and making like a, hey, 
a few years ago, this is what we talked about. Let's talk about it now. I Yes, I do. I would love to do that. I just have to find the right time and place to make that <laughs> have happen. Her, have, have your people call her people. <laughs> exactly. It's it's not a, yeah. Her, in her case, it is about, uh, about like that. You have to get through a few gatekeepers yeah. to get there. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, okay, so so let's get into this new part of the show where we want you to ask a question to the listeners or whoever's watching the video. Um, and so you're going to ask a question. And the way that I want you listening or watching to answer this question is to go to the show notes. <clears throat> go to the show notes, imagely.com slash podcast slash 43. And you're going to just comment with the answer to the question. Or if you're actually on YouTube and watching the YouTube video, just answer the question in the comment to the YouTube video. It's as easy as that, either the show notes or the YouTube video. So with that, Mark, what would you like to ask the listeners? Can I preface the question first with, uh, sure. so it kind of makes sense. So when yeah. I wrote this book, Advancing Your Photography, my desire with this book was to create a handbook that you can carry around with you that would really cover all stages of photography. And literally I, in your pocket. <laughs> and literally, yeah, in your camera bag or yeah. your pocket. And I wrote it yeah. with the idea that y you might not want to sit there and read a whole chapter. So at the end of each chapter, I put what was called a, a summary, crash course summary, which basically took what was at, what's in the chapter and summarized it into a page or a page and a half. And it really covers the whole spectrum of photography. So I'm prefacing that. This is a good book, by the way. I recommend it. It, <laughs> it, it wasn't just out of my own experience. It was also, remember, the result of those thousand hours of interviews with some really talented people. Right. Okay, but here's my question. I'm going to write my next book. And I want to really know, I think I know, but I would love to know from you out there, what is it, what's the single most important thing that if you learned about photography, you think would really be a game changer for you? What's that one area? You know, is it composition? Is it lighting? I'm going to guess th that it's not a, a purely technical thing because there's already so much information out there. It's, you know, if you want to know anything about your camera, it's going to be there already. But what would be the one single thing that you would love to know and have clearly defined? And that's, I would love to hear from you. Um, I have a question for you, Mark. Sure. What would you... Uh... Would you want to give away the book to your favorite answer to that question? I would. That's a great <laughs> idea. Because I really so, want to know, and I'd love to, have, yeah. I'd love to have that answer confirmed. I think I know what it is, and I'm not going to say what it is. Nice. But so would, so I'm, I'm guessing that if somebody answers with that exact, that exact answer that you're looking for, that's the person who's going to win the book. Maybe, but I also <laughs> want to keep my mind open. You know, I don't want to just go with <laughs> what I think the answer is. Yeah. I'm, I'm, right. I'm more interested in what the majority think. But out of all those, I would be happy to select one answer that I think, you know, really hits the nail on the head. And yes, I will happily send you a copy of my book. Nice. Okay, so to answer Mark's question, go to imagey.com slash podcast slash 43 and just comment with your answer to the question or go to the YouTube video if you're watching the YouTube video and just comment there. Again, his question is, what is the single most important uh, thing that you would want to learn uh, as, as a photographer that would be a game changer for you? Right? I got that. Sort you of. got it. Right. The game okay. changer is the important thing. Not just yeah, like, oh, changer. yeah, that would be cool, but would really flip the switch for you. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we're going to link to... Uh, all of Mark's, you know, his site, his YouTube channel, his book, if you want to pick up his book, uh, and all these different places. I'm going to link to the Edward Weston video, the Pepper number 30 photo, the Michael Adams video, um, and everything else in the show notes. So thank you, Mark, for joining us today. Um, My pleasure, Scott. You, 
you can find the show notes uh, from today's episode and where to find Mark and his book and everything at imagely.com slash podcast slash 43. And again, that's where you can answer the questions from this episode. So until next time. You've been listening to the WordPress Photography Podcast. To listen to other episodes and to subscribe to the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more, please visit imagely.com forward slash podcast. <laughs> yours, yours is much louder. <laughs> Two slates going at once, yeah.